Um, so I'm going to talk really fast, so don't say I didn't warn you. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story about how I became a social entrepreneur, and then I'm going to sort of walk you through what the experience of being me is like. But then there will be a point at the end, um, I promise. Uh, so I um, was trained in architecture at McGill University, and I finished at McGill University. And uh, you have two choices, right? When you become an architect, you have, oh, that's a microphone, wow. Um, you know, you either go into practice, right? So you finish architecture school, and you go into practice, and you, you go to another architecture firm, and you work, and you work, and you work, and you explore other people's ideas until there's a point where you can explore your own ideas, and that's usually a decade down the line. Um, or you can go into academics and you can think about architecture and not practice it for years and years and years and years. Um, and so for me, graduating from architecture school, and I, I just I had this, this sense, right, that, this sense that there was an opportunity in the architecture world that it wasn't really innovating quite yet. Um, and so I was looking to my peer group who were these guys, right? The average age of an architect is 55 years old. And so as I looked to them, I was like, okay, so I want to find the space in between. I think as, as architects, you get trained to deeply understand the human experience. You get trained to understand how people connect to space and how they move in space. Um, and as I looked to my peers who were doing amazing work all over the world, they weren't actually using the tools of design outside of our traditional practice. Um, and so as a 22-year-old, you know, I had these three ideas, and one of them was that we have a, a, a right, we have a human right to food, water, and shelter. And the idea that architecture and shelter were sort of interchangeable, I was like, well, what if, what if everyone, you know, everyone who I talk to, who's, who when I say, oh, I'm in architecture, and, and they go, oh, like, I don't know anything about architecture, and then they proceed to tell you everything they know about architecture, which is about their cottage, which is about the renovation they just did, which is about their old workplace that was a cubicle. Um, and I was listening to all these conversations, and I was like, There's, there has to be some kind of opportunity here. Now, at the same time, I'm watching all my friends leave university and go into the cubicle farms, right? They're, they're these creative, these, these designers who are going into cubicle farms and uh, for many reasons, and they're, they're being asked to be light switch innovative. So sit there and come up with an idea, um, which for me was a bit of a challenge. So uh, I also had this, this feeling, this like deep feeling that the space that I wanted to create, this weird space that didn't actually exist, would be a space where this is what my schedule looks like. So I don't know if everyone can read this, but at the end it says, be happy and go home after playing all day. Um, and so I started to look around and look at the landscape of design, which, you know, design thinking and human-centered design and all these buzzwords we hear now weren't part of the language. Um, and so at 22, I was looking at political think tanks, and I was like, well, they respond to really, really high-level issues. They respond to some of our, our most challenging issues in this country and in every country. Um, so what if we just took that model of thinking about these large issues and producing white papers and instead used creative output to tell that story? Um, and so at 22 years old, I started a studio called Architects. And the idea, this is a picture of our studio and a research project we were doing. Um, at 22, I started this place where you, we would bring together all these different disciplines, all these different types of people who had an inclination about the way they wanted to walk in the design world, but they didn't know exactly how they were going to do it. Um, so we so brought them together with three ideas. Idea number one was that kids would build buildings because kids are the future stewards of our built environment, and they have a right to, to not just like, be part of a consultation, but to actually be part of the, the building of the environment that they're going to inherit. And the second part was that we would have architecture and design education in every high school across this country. And the third was that we would use the public domain to have conversations about architecture in a way that was accessible. So people are always like trying to share everything they know about architecture. Why not put the writing on the wall? Why not say this is how we feel about it and this is how we engage with it? So I wanted to tell you the story today of my first paying client, which is, which is this guy. Um, and people, people don't usually believe me when I show this picture, but the first, the first paycheck that our studio ever got was from a project in this room. Um, and so the story of how I kind of started, I, was, I had moved back to Vancouver after university and I was teaching snowboarding and golf and decided I was going to I was going to start this social enterprise, which really means nothing. The next day, you're still sort of living at your parents' house, teaching snowboarding. Um, and so I picked up the Toronto Life uh, uh, Power 50 issue. And um, I, I went through the list of the 50 most powerful people in Toronto, and I picked up the phone. I called every single one. 
I was like, hi, my name's Zara, I'm 22 years old, I want to start a think tank, and it's going to be a space where we use this tools of design in places where it's most needed. So we're using design in places where they don't even know the language, but I think it could actually make some innovation happen. I didn't know the language of social innovation. I didn't know the language of social enterprise. That's not what I was trying to do. I was trying to just breathe life into an industry I felt so deeply about. So I, one of the phone calls was to Rita Davies, who, is the, who still is actually the director of culture for the city of Toronto. And I told her this, you know, I went on this rant. And she introduced me to her director of culture, who I went on a rant with, and then months passed. And I got a phone call, and he said, Hey, Zara, um, I've got $30,000 left before I close my doors at Live With Culture. Um, we're supposed to do some public art project in a priority neighborhood, and it's called East Scarborough. And uh, we're wondering if you want it, because I know you're kind of looking for work. And when you're 23 and you get offered $30,000 to do a public art project, you take it fast. Um, <laughs> So I took it, and I was new to Toronto. I'd moved to Toronto at that point, thinking that these 50 power people might be able to help me, because they were fairly friendly on the phone. Um, so I got a car, and I drove 45 minutes from where I was living downtown to this building, which is called the East Scarborough Storefront. Now, the East Scarborough Storefront is a social service delivery hub in one of Canada's most at-risk neighborhoods called Kingston Galloway. And this building services 75,000 people a year with five staff. So they're, ser they're running social services ranging from rehabilitation from people with for people with addiction to employment services to uh, Tamil yoga to cooking for people with physical disabilities. And so the director was, who was supposed to link me up with kids to do the public art project was walking me around the building. And at the time, it was repurposed from being a police station but never renovated. So you have these huge jail cells where kids are doing homework club. So you have Somali kids who have come to Canada doing homework club in jail cells. It just, it didn't make sense. So I'm walking around, I'm like, I'm being hired to do an art project in this community? Really? $30,000 for an art project? So I'm talking to the, the director, Ann Gloger, and I'm like, you know, I think we can do better than the art project. I think you need a new building. And I don't know why she trusted me, but she's like, yeah, I think, I think we do. And I said, you know, I think we should get the kids in the community to build the building. And she's like, okay, let's do it. So we parted ways thinking that $30,000 could build a building. It doesn't build a building. Um, and we decided that we wouldn't go into the community and, and promise that, you know, this community, all this revitalization when we had $30,000 in our pocket. So time passes, about a year, and the city goes, use it or lose it. So we have to have a charrette. So a charrette, does everyone know what a charrette is? Lots of people in one space that are diverse, building things together to solve a problem. Um, if you want to know the history, I can tell you after. Um, and so we brought a whole bunch of kids, kids who come to the storefront, kids whose parents, East Scarborough has uh, the highest density of new Canadians in the province. Two thirds of the people there live below the poverty line and the highest density of social housing in the province as well. So the kids who come there are there because their parents are working several jobs and they have nowhere to go. So we asked any of the kids, do you want to come to this designy architecture thing? So we had 25 kids, many of who had never left a three block radius, never actually left, left East Scarborough, and never been into a museum, come downtown to work with some of the best architects and planners and designers and students, we actually had a bunch of Ryerson students, in the city to the National Design Museum. They'd never set foot in a museum uh, to design the future of the East Scarborough storefront. So we gave them a site plan and a bunch of architects, and we were like, do it, right? So the kids spent the day working, and the architects were just blown away. They were like, who are these kids, and did you tell them anything about design? And they were coming up with these amazing models, which anyone who knows anything about participatory design has seen something like this, right? This is where you usually see like the public gets involved, and there's a shred, and then, and then the public's not involved anymore. So uh, we saw this, and uh, we, we saw an opportunity. So luckily, there was an amazing foundation called the Metcalf Foundation lurking around. And they said, look, what you started here is really interesting. We're going to give you a grant to see if you can get this going for one more year, because we think you're onto something. So uh, over the course of the next year, we met the kids every Thursday night. They just elected. If they wanted to come, they came. If they didn't, they didn't. We brought in architects and engineers and urban planners and landscape planners and filmmakers and artists. And we taught them how to build a building. We taught them how to fundraise millions of dollars. We taught them everything we know, right? Like, we know just as much as they do. So let's just share everything we know, see what you can do with it. So every Thursday, well, now for five years. But 
these kids learned about site plan approval. So, oh, you want to add a west wing? That means we're going to have to rezone the whole site. Here's what zoning is. Go to City Hall. Ask for a zoning variance. The kids did. And over the, over the years, um, these kids have gotten a lot of attention because we're looking at these kids as adult, not adults in the making, but decision makers now. That's a quote from David Driscoll, who is a amazing, amazing UN public participation uh, advocate. And these kids are getting a lot of attention because four or five years later, they are starting to cut the ribbon on renovations. They're raising millions of dollars. In a year and a half, they raised $2.1 million for their first phase of construction. Um, and in the last four years, they've turned this building into this building. So the thing that's really fun about this project is people are like, wow, it's so amazing. And like, like, just seeing this is incredible from, from that. And they, they're 4,000 square feet in, but they still have about 8,000 to go. But it gets more interesting. So the original project was the, the storefront building. So it was this. The kids were doing the design, and, and there, was a, there was a really famous story in the community about the daycare that operated out the towers was, you know, they would play, they would, the kids would meet here, and they would all hold on to the little you know, the string, the kids, yeah. daycare can have hold on. So the kids get on the string, and they walk all the way around this fence, they walk all the way around, come up, all the way around to play in this parking lot, because there's a fence there. But you can't take on the fence because it's a zoning issue. So, what started as, oh, we'll just rebuild the storefront, the kids are like, oh, but we have so much land. Could we, make, could we make play space? Could we make open space for kids to play? And we're like, yeah, sure, that's cool. So we expanded, in 2009, we expanded the project to the entire site of the storefront. Then an organization called ERA Architects, which is a fairly big architecture firm in the city, looked at what the kids were doing. And at the same time, they were launching a project a few years earlier called the Tower Neighborhood Renewal Project, which is looking at, at towers across specifically across the GTA, that are housing vertical poverty, and what we can do to reclaw the towers and also build community at the base of these towers. So ERA had been searching the country for a project to profile, and they stumbled across our project and they were like, hold on a second. These kids are the only ones in the entire country who are doing tower neighborhood renewal. So now these kids are the national case study for tower neighborhood renewal. So the project is now not only this site, but the project includes consulting with the thousands of people who live in the towers. What got more interesting was that the TRCA, the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority, saw what they were doing and said, huh, you're right in front of a ravine. Maybe the kids could do some sustainability planning. So the kids are now, in, they're now planning for this entire site. Now they don't know anything about urban planning, so what they've decided to do is create a local community planning board. And so they now run a community planning board that arranges for transit routes and and, and they can't really plan because Google Earth, if, you ever, if you've ever been on Google Earth outside of downtown, it's flat. They haven't 3D modeled it. So the kids last fall decided that there's a lot of unemployed new Canadians in the community. We know how to use AutoCAD and SketchUp. Why don't we just teach them how to use it and they'll 3D model the communities. So they spent the fall teaching unemployed Canadians in that community how to use SketchUp. So now there are 3D models in East Scarborough. They're running a local planning board. They're a national case study for economic, local economic development and you know, innovative youth capacity building and all that stuff too, so it's kind of exciting. The last thing about this project is uh, they were building the Tower Neighborhood Renewal site out. And they were integrating a component called a, a bioswale. Does anyone know what a bioswale is? No? Shake your head, no? Okay. <laughs> so a bioswale is ba basically a glorified pond. So uh, we're, we're going for lead platinum on the building. The kids have decided that sustainability is a huge factor in what they're trying to do. So we didn't have enough, enough space on the, on the site, and the kids go, okay, well, um, we can't fit the bioswale on the ground. Can we put the bioswale in the sky and call it the Skyoswale? And our architect, Paul, uh, Paul Dowsett from Sustainable TO, who works with me on the project, he looked at me and he was like, that doesn't exist. <laughs> and we're like, they just invented a green building innovation. So this fall, they fundraised $30,000 and filed a patent. So these six to 21 year olds from Canada's most at-risk community are now patent holders. So when they turn 16 and they go apply for jobs and an employer Googles their name, they will see that Ajeev holds a patent. Um, so it's interesting, right? It's like kids can build buildings. We can figure this out. Now, how do we, how do we integrate these processes? So, so this, is, uh, this is our studio. And every Friday at our studio, like you saw earlier on, play is really important to us. So how do we, how do we work with these kids? How do we, 
develop, develop and design these processes so they're empathic, as designers are supposed to understand people in a really intuitive way. So every Friday, we shut down our studio early, like I guess a lot of startups do these days, and we, we do this thing called grapes and chips. And because we're all designers, we've decided that we spend so much time on our computers all day that we need to not just engage with each other, but we need to engage with the city. And how does the city engage with creativity? So it's like under $10, under an hour, two hours, and we go out and we engage Torontonians with creativity. Now I show you this because this becomes the inspiration for innovation projects that we do. Um, can anyone, anyone tell me who they think drew this? Just yell it out. Anyone? Pardon me? School kids. School kids. How old? Kindergarten. Kindergarten. Okay. So this was a strategic plan done by the Deputy Minister of Economic Development and Innovation and his staff in June. <laughs> now, the, the process that we engaged, uh, the, the Deputy Minister gave us a call and he was like, look, he's like, we just have to cut 30% of our staff. We don't have more money. We're merging two ministries. And I'm being asked to do a strategic plan. So morale is low in my, in my department, in my ministry, and I'm being asked to do a strategic plan right now. How am I supposed to garner, garner the, the community together and rally them up? And so what we did was we invited people to let go of this notion of good. So we invited the entire staff, 300 members of the, de the, economic, the newly formed economic, uh, eh, economic Development and Innovation staff, to come together for a strategic planning session, but to, to let go of everything they knew about economic development and innovation to start off with and to just play. Like the idea that like every single person is the most low cost, high impact tool we possibly have in our arsenal. Every, is there anyone in this room who doesn't know how to play? There you go, no hands went up for those of you who can't see. Um, it's something that we all have access to and when we're playing, the, the field gets leveled, right? It's like we trust each other, we're, we're making decisions, we're creative, we're honest, right? Like we're in a bit of a flow. And, and there's, a, there's a famous author who wrote a book called Flow and Creativity, and he talks about what, when we really want to come up with pure innovation, we need to get into that space. And the older we get, the more scared we get to enter that space. It's, it's sort of like regressive, stop playing and get back to work. Oh, okay, I'll be fast. Uh, we also did a project with Minister Deb Matthews when she was the Minister of, Ch of, of Child and Youth Services, and she was writing the Poverty Reduction Strategy. She's like, I think that design, like what you're doing with design and playing in all these spaces with design is really interesting. Um, could you explore poverty reduction? And so I was like, yeah, I'd love to explore poverty reduction host a shred. Will you DJ the shred for us? And so what you see up here is Minister Dan Matthews DJing the events so that the kids from these neighborhoods and the not-for-profit leaders and the politicians and the corporations that actually came to this shred saw that Deb wasn't taking herself so seriously. She was a peer. She was trying to engage with them. And so when you hear these terms like human-centered design and design thinking, they're just jargon. It's really about connecting to what we already know. These are things that are really, really intuitive within us. So I'm going to give you one more example. Um, so my third dream of using museums to have conversations about architecture came true three years ago when I was innovator in residence at the National Design Museum. And I hosted a show called What Does Architecture Done For You Lately? And in the, in the show, there's all these different rooms. And in one room, it was called Architecture and Equality. And in the room, we had all these whitewashed models of buildings um, and 1,400 ping pong balls that were printed with different demographic groups. And so all you had to do was walk into the room, grab a scoop of balls, and just vote. Say, OK, so the young professional lives in a condo, and the, the student lives in an apartment. And you used to tell us where people live. Now, people would grab a whole bunch of ping pong balls. They'd go around and vote. And then they would take the low-income family and disabled person, the yellow and blue ones, and they would throw them back in the main bucket. So it's really interesting how people are like, oh, I don't know anything about architecture, and then all of a sudden they're screaming their opinions. When we had a huge, pardon me? Did you take those ones, the low-income and the where? Back in the main bucket. They didn't want to use them. They didn't want to say, oh, we put low-income people in apartment towers, and we put disabled people in the most, the most difficult situation for someone with an impairment. They didn't want to say it, but they were saying it by leaving a bucket of yellow and blue ping pong balls behind. So when we say we're doing design research, we mean we're allowing people to speak in a language that's a little bit more accessible. So I'm going to really race right now. So it's about play, right? <laughs> and that play is not easy. Um, I'm going to skip that. And so the thing that I've learned, I was asked to talk about what I've learned as a social entrepreneur. And I learned that I like waited my entire career 
Uh, you know, now we're writing a book on the Community Design Initiative, which is the project I show you, showed you. I waited my entire career, which has been the past seven years as a social entrepreneur, to be the expert, right? So it's like, I am now the expert on community design, and I get invited to all these tables to talk about it. And I sit at the table, and I feel like an imposter. Because what I was doing was not like, oh, we do this and we do this. It was, you know, I was asking a question, and then I was asking another question, and then something amazing was happening. And yesterday I gave a talk about human-centered design, and uh, someone in the crowd said, you know what you remind me of? You remind me of uh, the, the designer couple called Eames. They're well known for their chair. And they used to say that, that knowledge, if you try and sell knowledge, it's a finite resource. If you try and sell discovery, it's infinite wealth. That's this, right? Like, that's really interesting. So when I tell people about why I'm a social entrepreneur, I don't tell them, well, aside from what I did today, how I did it, <laughs> right? I tell them how I learned to do it. People always ask, so like, how do you make money? How do you meet these people? How did you convince these people to, to let you do these things? And I'm like, well, this is how I learned in these spaces. And what I've realized is that it's such a, it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a lot more difficult than, than you think to document what you've learned rather than just storytelling. Um, and so as you grow as a social entrepreneur, if you're thinking of becoming one or if you are one and if you're developing like, you know, a new curiosity around social entrepreneurship, listen for the learnings, right? Listen for the people who are, who are seeking to share discovery. Because I think we can't all pretend that we know, that we know what it's gonna look like because we're all moving into spaces that are completely new to us. That's, wh that's why we're entering them. Um, and so if I, could, if I could encourage you to do one thing is, is you know, play and, and, and really, really celebrate discovery.